welcome to our final talk on our alumni at home with Mac new year new mindset series. My name is Christine Kennedy and on behalf of the Office of Alumni Engagement, I'd like to thank you for joining us to hear from one of our favorite McMaster professors, Dr. Joe Kim from the Department of Psychology, Neuroscience and Behavior. Before I begin, I would like to take this time to recognize that my home, which is just up the road from McMaster's campus, is currently on the traditional territory shared between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nations, which was acknowledged in the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. That wampum uses the symbolism of a dish to represent the territory and one spoon to represent that the people are to share the resources of the land and only take what they need. We always start our webinars with the land acknowledgement because we recognize it's important to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this land and the history they share as a step towards reconciliation. We are so pleased you've taken the time to join us this evening and I'm confident you will uh, leave the webinar with newfound skills and ideas to add to your productivity toolbox. Uh, just a reminder that uh, because this is a series, we like to give away free things. Um, so for every event that you or every um, webinar that you have attended, uh, you will have a chance to win uh, a, a Philips Smart Sleep Wake Up Light. So what we're going to do is we're going to take everyone who's attended. So the more you attended, the um, you know, more chances you have of winning because your name will be in it three, four or five times. We're going to randomly pick three winners and we'll let those winners know the week of February 5th. Uh, just a reminder that the talk is being recorded and you'll receive an email with a link to the recording in a few days. Thanks to everyone who submitted <laughs> pre-submitted questions. We had seriously a million, I would say, no, probably not a million, but we had close to a thousand people who registered and I think we had close to that many um, questions. So I think many of the questions will be um, answered in Joe's, uh, in Joe's talk and we have, we'll, we'll have lots of time for a live Q&A. So if your question wasn't answered then, feel free to type that in the Q&A section. If you could leave the chat section free for any technical difficulties you have, that would be great. Like, oh, I can't hear the speaker or I'm having, I can't see the, the PowerPoint. That would be helpful because I always have to go through uh, between the two. So if you can just put questions in the Q&A and sort of comments about the technical part of the webinar and the chat, that would be really helpful. Thank you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Joe Kim. He's an associate professor in the Department of Psychology, Neuroscience and Behavior, and he has three major roles sort of on campus. He's the director of the Education and Cognition Lab. He is the faculty director of the McCall McBain Postdoctoral Fellows Teaching and Leadership Program, and we're actually doing an event in two weeks on February 14th that involves the McCall McBain uh, Fellows. More details will come at the end of the webinar for that. And he's also the principal instructor for the innovative first year psychology course, Matt Intro Psych, which I took in 2016, best course ever. Uh, Dr. Kim is actively involved in the science of teaching and learning because he is a cognitive psychologist and organizes the annual McMaster Education and Cognition Conference. And that is in July. So if you're interested in that, send us an email and we can put you on the, uh, we can put you on the email list for that. So that's it, Joe. Over to you. Let's learn how to be more productive using psychology, my favorite subject. Thank you so much, Christine. And uh, thank you all of you for uh, joining us today. I think uh, given the time of year that it is, uh, we've just ended January and entered February. Uh, I have a feeling there's a lot of New Year's resolutions that uh, have kind of been set aside. So I want to begin with uh, by talking about goals versus systems. So what do I mean by goals? Um, so if we plot across time, your progress, um, a goal uh, is something that's, I would characterize as being sort of like a short term destination, like maybe a goal that you have is to run a 10 kilometer race, right? Uh, you heard that running is good, and that's something that you want to do. And let's say that with some work, you reach your goal and you complete the race. Um, amazing. You've reached your goal. But the question now that you're done is, what is next? Maybe uh, you might just end up hanging up your shoes and then just checking this item off your list. Now, getting your room, your bedroom tidied up is also 
a goal, a short-term goal. Let's say that you decide to do this. And after an afternoon of sorting and organizing, um, let's say your room is finally tidy. You can see everything. But without a system, you, you know deep down that it's just going to get messy again. So by a system, what I mean is something a little bit different. It's a series of processes, habits, and even your mindset uh, that sustains beyond a short-term goal. So a system of a healthy lifestyle might incorporate regular running along with eating well and making quality sleep a priority. You might adopt a system because you want to identify as a person who values being healthy uh, and prioritizing uh, well-being. So when it comes to your room, having a system to be an organized and tidy person is what will actually keep it that way in the long term. So maybe part of this would be making your bed every morning, putting your dirty clothes in the hamper, returning items to their appropriate place, uh, you know, going through all your clothes and making sure everything fits and is presentable. This is what I mean by an actual system. So as I mentioned, we're now into February. And uh, at the beginning of, uh, of this year, I, uh, uh, when I went to my uh, yoga studio, it was just completely packed. And so I'm sure you've had that experience. Uh, health clubs, gyms, et cetera, they're completely packed. Um, and then after a few weeks uh, of being just hectic, it soon gets back to this normal steady state. So what's wrong with these traditional New Year's resolutions uh, that we make? Sometimes they can be really lofty goals. Sometimes they could be sort of ambiguous. But what typically happens is that they lack the true intention and follow through that can really only be sustained by adopting a system that you commit to. So, you know, very common items are like, I want to lose weight. Uh, I want to quit smoking or something ambiguous. Like I want to be happier or I want to improve my finances, my relationships. Often these are just short-term destinations without the uh, ongoing system to maintain them. Okay. So, let's take a very common New Year's resolution of, of losing weight. Let's say that you even have a specific target goal, like you want to lose five kilos. And let's say a person really kind of dedicates themselves to this goal. Uh, they count the calories, they do a lot of cardio, and they exercise for a few weeks, all the while absolutely hating it. And let's say that they finally reach their goal. It's it feels like quite the sacrifice and maybe they're even quietly complaining along the way and even have the mindset that they can't wait till this is all over when they finally reach their goal without and what they're actually saying is so that i can get back to my regular ways so in this scenario the person is going to reach their goal um temporarily enjoy the moment but then nothing will be sustained and they'll probably be right back to where uh they started so the cumulative results of a system takes of habits takes time to see their benefits. So let's say you have a financial goal, you're trying to save money, and maybe you're trying to set aside 10% of, of your salary. 10%, um, you know, on, on a given day uh, uh, might not look like a lot in your bank account, but you know, over many years, uh, it's going to accumulate. Um, and so it takes time to see the cumulative results of this system of habits. So similarly, not giving into an impulse, impulse purchase at the supermarket checkout counter because you want to save money to buy, let's say, a brand new bike. That saves you money now. But the, your total net financial worth is what we might call like the lagging measure of all of your financial habits. And choosing a healthy dinner is good for your gut. But your fitness and well-being is a measure of all of your health habits. So as a psychologist, you know, these are problems that I, I like to think about and how we could try to set up a system of behaviors and mindset that can motivate us to create these effective systems. So systems start by recognizing and motivating these behaviors. 
And so there's three questions I really want you to think about. How can I cue the habit, streamline it, and reinforce it? So let's take running. So for a long time, I wanted to become a runner. Um, and it, it, it's just, there's so many things about it that appealed to me. And I had tried becoming a runner uh, several times, um, you know, even ran some pretty good distances, but it just never, st- uh, it, it just never did stick. And so um, if, if you want to make a, a, a habit like that stick and really identify yourself as a runner, um, here's a few things that I found to be successful. Um, so I want to make running part of a, an overall system of health and well-being. So for me, um, what, what, what made sense for me in my schedule was to go for a run in the morning before things got hectic, because at the end of the day, I felt like I'm too tired or there's just other things I have to pay, I'll pay attention to. So kind of focusing on the morning. So this way, for me, the time of day itself can act as a cue. Wake up in the morning, go for, go for a run. Now, the streamlining part of this is um, setting out my clothes and my shoes the night before. So I'm, I'm all set to go. So there's no excuses to get in the way when I wake up in the morning. Um, better yet, have a running partner who is absolutely counting on you. So you might uh, tell yourself, oh, you know, I don't feel 100%. Maybe I won't go running today. But if you have someone who is counting on you and waiting for you, it's much, uh, you're probably going to go uh, follow through with it. So these are all ways to streamline that process. And then third, we want to reinforce this habit. And so one way to reinforce it with it is a little reward. So something like in the case of running, I really like coffee. And so uh, there's a lot of amazing coffee shops around Dundas. And so a reward for me could be looking forward to an amazing cup of coffee that I will have immediately after the run. In fact, I won't even drink any coffee until I go on that run. And at the end of the run, I get that little uh, reward of an amazing cup of coffee. Another thing I found to be rewarding was that I really like listening to audiobooks. So some people, when they're running, they listen to uh, music. I actually tend to lean towards listening to audiobooks. And I will typically find kind of uh, exciting <laughs> stories that, you know, I, they're kind of cliffhangers. And I can't wait to find out what's next. And I find that while I'm running, I really get into the run. And at the end of the run, sometimes I want to know what's going to happen next, but uh, I don't allow myself to hear it until I do my next run. So here's three steps that you might try think of thinking of using for any new habit that's going to be part of a larger system that you're going to be looking at. How do you cue that habit? How do you streamline that habit? And then how do you reinforce it? So um, this is something that, you know, I've taken quite seriously. And um, at this point, I've developed a pretty set uh, morning routine. And I've added to this morning routine. I tweak it a little bit here and there. Um, But I set aside the first hour after I wake up to fit in uh, this routine that I follow pretty much every day. So the first thing I will do is meditate for about five minutes. So I'll, I'll listen to an app, typically right in bed as I'm about to get up. I will meditate uh, for five minutes. It's just another part of an overall health and well-being um, system that I want to integrate for a long time. Then um, I'll do uh, a 30 minute um, calisthenic uh, workout. Um, and that's another thing that uh, I just really want to integrate into uh, this system of health and well being. Then I'll spend about 10 minutes journaling and planning out uh, my day and how things are going to fold, prioritize some uh, major tasks uh, that I want to get done. And then I'll spend about five minutes um, uh, on, I use an app called Duolingo for uh, learning Spanish and brushing up on my Korean. 
And um, it's, it's just another one of these things that I want to kind of build in uh, to my own self-improvement. I'm on day 429 of my Duolingo streak, something I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> kind of proud of uh, and I find uh, reinforcing. Um, and then uh, I'll work on uh, a work-related project, a top priority project for about 30 minutes. And so that takes me through uh, the first hour of my day. And I'm pretty consistent. Uh, and it's something that I've slowly built into this morning routine. I would never recommend to anyone that you pick out all the things that you think should be part of your system uh, for a morning routine and then just try them all at once. Each one of these were uh, gradually brought in, uh, building towards uh, the system that I'm looking at. And in 2024, you know, I, I'm looking to further uh, improve this system. Um, some things I'm considering doing is that I really want to set a time every day to write for an hour. There are many different writing projects that I'm interested in pursuing, uh, including writing a book <laughs> that uh, Christine uh, has told me that, you know, I, I should really get on it. And, and I agree with her. Um, I also really enjoy reading and sometimes it falls to the side. So I really want to make that into a priority for, for this system as well. Reading a book, reading books for pleasure, but as well as reading books for knowledge. And uh, a new project I've taken on is that I coach soccer. And so it's something that I want to learn more about the theory and practice uh, of soccer coaching. So those are other um, uh, habits that I'm trying to build in to uh, my system. Okay. So Christine mentioned uh, that uh, I'm the director. I, I have three major roles at the university. Uh, I direct the education and cognition lab. Um, I teach uh, in our large introductory psychology course, and I'm the faculty director for uh, a postdoc training program. And a common link across these three roles is that I'm interested in understanding and implementing the conditions that lead to durable learning. So this is a system that I try to integrate uh, across these roles. So activating this system of durable learning extends beyond a goal. So for example, a student might have a short-term goal of they want to get an A uh, in a course that I'm teaching. That's fine. But what I want to integrate is a system of durable learning and motivation to become a lifelong learner. That is something that extends beyond this short-term goal of getting an A in the course that I'm teaching. And I'll give you a few examples of how I, as an instructor, I'm implementing this system um, into uh, my teaching. So a typical university course uh, looks something like this when it comes to uh, grading. So you you might have a couple of midterms and a final exam. So I would describe this as infrequent high stakes testing. And perhaps not surprisingly, um, what students end up doing is spending a lot of time cramming right before each of these major evaluations and not necessarily building uh, durable learning. So one way that my course is different is that we do have a midterm and we do have a final exam, but throughout the year, there are frequent low stakes testing and they're actually collaborative open book opportunities. So students can actually work with each other. And the point of this is to um, have frequent opportunities to receive feedback on how you're doing, to teach each other, and to, you know, I, I even encourage students to really debate uh, the answers with each other, because I think that's what will help to promote that long-term learning. Um, here are the types of review questions that I typically favor uh, giving to our students. So this question says, how does tonotopic organization of sound differ from topographic organization of vision? And there's a couple of features I want to point out here. So one, um, tonotopic organization, that's something that we discussed this week. Um, and Top, uh, topographic organization of vision is something that we discussed the week prior. And so here is another system in place to uh, have students 
directly connect concepts across weeks of study. All right, I'll give you one more example. So at the instructional design level, there are basically four things that I want students to uh, learn in my course. And I hope Christine picked up on these things when she was in my course. Um, and these are conclusions or, or themes that thread out, thread across the entire course. And we continuously revisit these over and over again in different uh, contexts of content. So these are all examples of how I'm building in this system of durable learning um, that will extend beyond any student's short-term goal of just trying to get an A in the course. Okay, so let's apply this knowledge to you and why you might be interested in applying goals versus systems. So maybe this is the question that is on your mind uh, when you signed up for this webinar. How can I meet work demands with my attention, time, and resources? Well, there's a few things I want to point out. So first, as a cognitive psychologist, I, I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that we have limited cognitive resources and, and energy, really. So uh, there's only so much that we could pay attention to. Um, and so how we allocate and prioritize our attention is a very important factor. And let's be honest, it probably feels like you have increasing work demands and you know maybe you even want to throw in a life there. So it's probably more accurately capturing your situation if we had the sentence like this, how can I meet increasing work demands and life demands with my limited attention, time, and resources? Okay, so what I'm proposing to you is uh, three steps, focus, problem solve, and restore. And Let's go through each of these uh, so I can give you a bit of a sketch of what I mean by them. And then we'll go into a little bit more detail for each of these points of focus, problem solve, and restore. So let's begin with focus. What do I mean by focus? Well, let me give you a hypothetical experiment. I want you to imagine that you're on a Zoom call. You're in a meeting and you are having a conversation with a brand new colleague that you've never met before. Okay. Now, in the middle of that conversation, there's some sort of internet glitch, and you get disconnected, and then you uh, immediately get reconnected. But unknown to you, somehow, you actually end up uh, being connected with a different colleague. The question is, would you notice that you're speaking with a completely different colleague? Now, I'm sure most of you would say, yeah, of course I would. Believe it or not, uh, this is there's there's a there's a famous experiment done uh, in psychology where um, an experimenter would go up to uh, random people on a street corner, engage them in conversation for a few minutes. Um, and then there's going to be a clever, and brief distraction, um, and that person, that experimenter is going to be swapped for a completely different person. And then the question is, will the participant on the street corner realize that they're speaking with someone completely different? So here is a video, and we can see the swap, and this particular participant does not notice, and he continues on, uh, speaking uh, with the brand new uh, research, uh, researcher. And in fact, he's even bringing in the help of another person standing on the corner to give directions to this man. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, okay, surely that must be the exception. But um, what the researchers found was that 50% of people uh, did not notice that the person that they were speaking with was swapped for another person. What this and many other experiments demonstrate is that we overestimate. In fact, we vastly overestimate how much information we can process with our limited attentional resources. Okay, what do I mean by problem solve? 
each of us has many recurring uh, tasks, challenges, and problems that we have to uh, work through every day. So for each of these recurring challenges, tasks, and problems, I want you to think about whether or not the solution that or the, the workflow that you're engaged in is optimized. So identify that recurring problem, test the solution, refine, and then repeat this process. So I'll, I'll give you three examples that come up in my work all the time. So here's a common task that I have to do. I have to uh, create and deliver uh, various different presentations. Um, I get a lot of email. And so I have to actually, I have to end up typing uh, sometimes the same sentences over and over again. Sometimes I'll get you know, over 100 emails a day that require my attention. Um, and then periodically, uh, I have to go on an overnight uh, work trip and I have to pack uh, my suitcase. Okay, now, what I mean by optimizing this is that um, over the years, I, I've really thought about how I design my presentations uh, and my lectures, and I've refined a workflow that I know works for me. So it's not like I have to reinvent the wheel every single time I have a brand new lecture or presentation to do. I have a refined system that I've really been thinking about and collecting feedback on and improving. Okay, how about typing the same things over and over? I, I found myself doing this for a long time. Uh, sometimes I'd have to write the exact same paragraph again. Um, and then I realized um, there's a better solution for this. So in this case, I use a text replacement app called Text Expander. And uh, I really love this. So with just a few keystrokes, I could bring up a recurring sentence, phrase, entire paragraph, whatever the case might be. Um, and so this saves me so much time. So here I just type in a few keystrokes and then entire paragraph comes up. So I could spend the time to refine that paragraph, um, test it out, see if there's any uh, missing information. And now in the future, when I need to type that, I just type in a few keystrokes. I sync, this is synced with my phone. So I could pull up that key, a replacement keyboard on my phone. So even when I'm on my phone, I could type some very complex messages with just a few keystrokes and get information that people want. Okay, now when it comes to packing for overnight, as silly as it sounds, uh, for the longest time, uh, I would sort of procrastinate about packing my overnight bag. Part of it was some minor anxiety, like, oh, I, I better remember to bring everything that I need. Um, and it would sort of probably follow me throughout the day. Um, and then I realized, you know what, I need the exact same things on every single trip that I go to. Uh, so I don't have to reinvent the wheel. So on one particular trip where I, I just noted, here's all the things I had, or here's the things that were missing. And I made a list and I keep this list. And now every single time I have to pack for an overnight trip, I just bring up this list. I bring all these items and I'm done. It takes me five minutes to pack. Uh, instead of procrastinating for a long time and worrying. Um, so this is an improved process so that I can just get on with it and uh, go on with the rest of my life. Okay, the last part of this three-step process is restoration. And it's something that we many of us uh, will ignore, but having a system for restoring uh, will give you the energy and the, the refreshed motivation the next day to carry on with all the things that you have to do. Now, one of the best things that uh, cognitive psychologists know that you should do is to go for a 30-minute walk, uh, preferably uh, somewhere with nature. And so I work at McMaster University, uh, very fortunate to have amazing nature trails uh, all around us, um, but maybe you don't have access to a nature trail. Maybe you don't have access to a 30 minute break in the day where you can do that. Well, research by McMaster University uh, professor Marty Gavala um, uh, demonstrates that even a exercise snack 
something as simple as vigorously walking up three flights of stairs. If you do that three times per day, even separated by an hour or to four hours of recovery uh, between, that will significantly uh, improve your fitness. And we know that there's a connection between overall physical fitness uh, and improved cognitive function. So make restoration a key part of your workflow uh, uh, system as well. Okay, so now that I've given you an overview, I wanna go into a little bit more detail for each one of these points. So let's begin with focus. Many of us multitask. And the question I want you to ask yourself is, are you good at multitasking? When I ask my students, are you good at multitasking? Many of them say, yeah, I'm pretty good at multitasking. Um, but research from cognitive psychology demonstrates, no, you're not good at multitasking. No one is good at multitasking. There is a rare group, perhaps, uh, in the human population that are so-called super taskers that show some reduced um, um, decrement in processing speed and errors when you give them multiple things to do, but everyone breaks down uh, when you're trying to multitask. And so making a choice to do just one thing at a time um, it's something that takes sort of willpower and regulation because it's so tempting to have many different things uh, open on your screen that can be very distracting. Now, when I tell my students, you're not good at multitasking, some of them are skeptical and say and think, well, I think I'm the exception. I think I'm a super tasker. So here is a little demo that uh, uh, I try out with my students. Um, and Christine, if, if you could unmute, maybe you could uh, be our stand-in uh, participant here. So we're going to do a multitasking procedure, a very simple multitasking procedure. And I'd like you to try play along at home. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to read aloud each word of the sentence. And then, Christine, I want you to categorize it. If it is a noun, say yes. If it is not a noun, you're going to say no. And we're going to go through the whole sentence. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So everyone at home, follow along. We. Yes. Are. No. In. No. This. Yes. This. No. Room. Yes. Okay. Christine, one, two, three. You got 80%. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully at home you did better. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to make this task a little bit harder. I'm going to, I'm going to add more words to the sentence. Uh -oh. Okay. And I'm going to see how well you follow along. Okay. All right. Got it. Okay. So everyone at home, multitaskers ready. Here we go. The. No. Cat. Yes. Was. No. Content. No. In. No. The. No. Barn. Yes. With. No. The. No. Mice. Yes. Okay, very good. So Christine, you got 100% that time. So here's what I want you to, to, uh, to know this. So um, your eyes went across the screen. So you probably read every single word. You also heard me say every single word. I also asked you to think about every single word because you had to uh, categorize it. So here's my question for you. What was the second sentence we just read out loud together? Something about a cat. Okay, I, I know this. So with the cat and then in the, no, it was something in the room. Definitely about a cat and a mouse. It was a cat and a mouse. So I'm remembering the, the first and the last. Okay. On mice, mice. Okay. Yeah, you, got, you got parts of it. The cat was content in the barn with the mice. So even though you had all of this information being collected by your sensory systems, um, the, the cost of task switching has drained some of your cognitive resources more than single task. If you had just read the sentence without doing this back and forth, uh, you probably would have recalled more. Thanks so much, Christine. And I'm sure those of you, I'm sure many of you at home uh, also struggled uh, with this task as well. So 
what I hope to convince you of here is that we're not good at multitasking. And so if you have a computer screen with many different things going on, lots of things competing for your attention, it's going to be difficult to get the task done at hand. Now, here's a very interesting study from uh, my, my lab co-direct, led by my co-lab director, Fari Asana. So in this study, students are in a lecture hall. They're told, pay attention. There's going to be a test at the end of this uh, lecture. And all the participants in this study do not have a computer. So it's not like they can't actually go on a computer or a phone and start multitasking. They have no choice but to just kind of pay attention. Um, but throughout this lecture hall, unknown to these participants are some uh, confederates. They're in on the experiment. They're posing as students. They have a computer. So they're also paying attention following instructions, but every once in a while, they start multitasking. They start doing other stuff. Now, if you're a participant in the study, based on where you're sitting in this lecture hall, you may have a view of someone who is occasionally multitasking, or you may not. So this sets up a very neat comparison. We can see the students who, uh, we can see the participants who have a view of someone multitasking versus those who do not have a view of someone multitasking. And yeah, it makes a difference. So we can see that those who have a view of someone multitasking perform worse on the comprehension test that happens at the end of this lecture. Now, these students are not actually multitasking themselves, but just watching someone else have the opportunity to multitask uh, can have a direct impact on you. And so if you are doing work on the computer, I want you to think about what is actually open on your computer? Do you have many different things open? Do you have a mail icon? Do you have messages? Do you see the badge count going up? And so even though you're trying to commit to focusing on just one task, um, you see that badge icon, badge count uh, going up, no notifications blinking, and part of your mind is thinking, oh, I wonder what that is. I wonder what's going on there. So the solution, of course, is to shut that off to the extent possible. And I know in some situations it may not be possible, but you may have control over how many different things are open on your computer when you're trying to focus on writing up a report, uh, for example. Now, this sort of takes some willpower because it could be kind of exciting to open up a message or open up an email. Um, maybe it'll be something good. Maybe, maybe it's not. And so it, it's kind of exciting. And so this is, you know, what psychologists would call self-regulation. Can you delay immediate gratification for that later reward? So it's a, it's a really interesting uh, uh, concept, self-regulation, that uh, we think starts to emerge uh, around age four uh, in, uh, in children. And so there, there's, a, there's a famous test, it's called the marshmallow test, uh, that you can try out if you have a four-year-old at home. And here's the rules. You, you say you can have one marshmallow now, or if you can wait 15 minutes, uh, you can have two marshmallows. You can double your reward. So can you delay this immediate gratification for this later reward? It can be pretty hard. So here's my daughter, Monica, when she turned four. And um, you know, I, I tell my students that she was trained for four years for this test. And the way she was trained was that we would go to uh, go shopping, maybe we bought cupcakes. And then, uh, you know, which is back in the car, seatbelt, hand her the cupcakes and say, this isn't for now, this is for later. Um, and at first, this seemed like a very odd situation to her, but after a while, it became normalized. And so uh, here she is, uh, kind of struggling, but, you know, kind of soothing herself, getting through uh, what's probably the longest 15 minutes uh, of her life uh, to date uh, in order to receive what she really likes. She actually absolutely loves uh, marshmallows. And success. So, by the way, that's what it's like uh, when your dad is a psychologist. Okay, now... A related concept here is procrastination, and we all experience procrastination. Why? Because there's a lot of competition for our attention, and we're thinking about kind of these immediate rewards. 
uh, that would be so much more fun to do than the actual work in front of uh, in front of us. So when that happens, and it happens to me as well, um, one useful method is to kind of formalize that uh, system that I talked to at the beginning of having a queue, streamlining the process and having some sort of reinforcement. So let's say there's a report that I have to write. Um, in fact, I do have a report I need to write uh, that's due imminently. And to be perfectly honest, I've been procrastinating on it because there's so many more interesting things I would rather do uh, than complete this report. So I can use this myself. So pick a task for focused deep work. In my case, it's this report. Um, set a timer for 25 minutes and begin. It's the only thing that's going to be open on my computer uh, to the extent possible. I'm going to shut out all other uh, distractions and I'm promising myself all I have to do is work on this for 25 minutes. I can do 25 minutes. No, nope, no problem. If Monica can delay, uh, you know, waiting 15 minutes, I can do 25 minutes, no problem. At the end of that 25 minutes, I am going to take a well-deserved five-minute break to refresh. Um, and then I'll repeat for three to four Pomodoros. And that break that I take would be whatever I identified at the beginning. Maybe it's uh, going out, gra maybe grabbing a coffee or a snack or, you know, watching a TikTok video, whatever the case might be. I will follow through my reward. I'll complete this entire process for three or four uh, Pomodoro sessions, so-called Pomodoro sessions. Uh, and at the end of that, um, you know, once I've done that three or four of these sessions together, I put in a, a fair deal of work if I, if I follow through this process. And now I'm going to take an extended break for 30 minutes and do something that I really enjoy. As simple as it sounds, it really works. Uh, and I find that when there's something I'm really procrastinating about, convincing myself by using this very simple behavioral method really seems to do the trick. Okay. Now, let's take a bigger view on focusing. So we all have limited time and energy and, our, and attention. And so one thing that I, I encourage you to think about is coming up with a mission statement. Um, organizations, large organizations like McMaster University, they have mission statements. Um, any group that you organize uh, should ideally have a mission statement. You should have a mission statement. Why? Because it's a default guide to high level decision making. So it's worth your time to invest to think about, well, what are my passions and abilities? What are things that I want to improve? What do I stand for? What are my principles and values? And what are the goals and systems that I'm trying to build towards? This helps you put all the big pieces into place. And let me give you an example from my professional life. So when I was first hired as a faculty member and uh, I started up uh, my lab, it's called the Education and Cognition Lab, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. And so um, when a student in my lab uh, uh, came up to me and said, hey, can we do this experiment? My immediate reaction was, yes, let's do it. Let's start collecting data. Uh, and I was very excited. And running a lab is like running any other organization. We have limited resources. We have limited personnel. We have a limited budget. And so by me just kind of saying yes to everything, um, I found that we were doing many things very poorly. And so one day, uh, you know, I thought like, we need a mission statement for the lab. And so I got together with my lab and we had a lot of discussions. And then we tried to figure out, well, what does our lab actually stand for? We were doing a whole bunch of different experiments that 
were kind of loosely about education, uh, but there was no real focus. And so here's what we came up with. We use innovative tools to explore how applied cognition impacts authentic learning conditions. This really captures what we as a lab are actually interested in doing. We're, we can't do every single thing in cognition and related to education. We have to start saying no to some things. And so this allowed us to run better experiments. And so uh, if someone came up with a new experiment idea, and if it's gonna use like 20% of our lab resources, we better really think about it because we can only do this five times. And so we hold it up against this mission statement. Does it match? If so, we'll make it happen. If it doesn't, we can't prioritize it. So I have a personal mission statement as well uh, that helps me to make decisions uh, within my career. And so here's what I've come up with. To help people enjoy lifelong learning, tell their stories, and use their time wisely. And so when there are different opportunities or projects that come my way, um, including this, this invitation about giving this talk about goals and systems, this pretty much matches up with my life mission statement. So it's something that uh, I will choose to prioritize. So um, lots of different questions for you to think about. Should I volunteer in my community? Who should I spend my social time with? What training and workshop should I take? Uh, should I join a, a local team? Um, you only have a limited amount of time and energy uh, and, and, and attention. And so if you kind of say yes to all of these things, you'll probably end up doing them less uh, efficiently and with, uh, with less productivity than if you have a mission statement to make priorities about which of these uh, you think you want to do the best. So this, this idea of this mission statement for this broader overview uh, of focus, it's something that I would encourage you to do. So thinking about your passions, your current skills, uh, and what you might want to uh, improve, thinking about what you stand for, your principles and values, and then seeing how that connects with your life and career goals, and then building a system uh, towards that. Now, just like with running, where uh, it helps to have a running partner to keep you accountable, it also helps to have a mission statement <laughs> a partner to keep you accountable. So some homework, um, I would recommend that you invest uh, some time into really thinking, maybe for the first time about, you know, what do you stand for? What do you want to prioritize? And coming up with your own personal mission statement, it's something that will change across your life. So I revisit my own mission statement uh, at least three times a year. Like I, 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 as an academic, I kind of think on the semester basis. So at the end of every semester, beginning of the next one, uh, that's when I, I, I revisit my mission statement, think about the projects that I'm working on and how I, what I want to prioritize for the next four months. So if you have someone that uh, you can be accountable for, uh, that will just help you to stay on track. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about problem solving. So here are three uh, problems or tasks that uh, I, I face in my work. Uh, but it's something that this is a, a strategy that I think is very helpful for you to apply uh, across your life. So I'll give you some examples from my life. So uh, during the COVID-19 uh, you know, pandemic, when we we're all stuck at home, one of the things that I found, a habit that I had inadvertently developed was to doom scroll. So I was constantly reading news, uh, especially as I was about to go to bed, I would just start up uploading my brain with lots of uh, you know, bad news about things I couldn't possibly do anything about. And then it would disrupt uh, my sleep, not surprisingly, and then it would disrupt my well-established system of uh, of morning habits uh, to go through. So the whole kind of system started falling apart. And so I realized I've got to cut this out at the source and remove access to my phone, um, uh, especially in bed, because I just ended up uh, winding my brain up instead of winding down uh, to go to sleep. 
Now, let me give you another simple example uh, about problem solving. So the way that my kitchen was set up, so I have a dishwasher and when I would unload my dishwasher, I would walk all the way across the kitchen and put the dishes away. Okay. It's not a big deal, but every single time I unload the dishwasher, I, I would think to myself, this makes no sense that the dishes are all the way on the other side when the, when the dishwasher is here. And so one day I spent 20 minutes reorganizing the kitchen cupboards so that the dishes now go immediately above the dishwasher because it just makes so much more sense. Now, does it save me a lot of time? No. It probably saves me, you know, seconds to minutes a day uh, to do that at most. But it also takes away my thinking. Oh, this is so annoying. Why do I have it set up this way? And so, making this small adjustment to problem solving, even this minor task, I found to be very helpful. But there are other problems and challenges that you could think about that might be impeding your work. So, for example, here here are a couple that affected me. Um, when I'm at home working, I find that, you know, I could get into a phase where I start doing what I might charitably call productive procrastination. So I'm, I'm, I'm say I'm trying to work on a presentation. I've got my workflow, but then I convince myself, you know what? I need a picture of a, of a dog, uh, not just any dog, but, you know, maybe a dog wearing glasses. Right. And so go online and I could go down the rabbit hole. I could probably fill up an entire hour looking for the perfect picture or creating the perfect picture with uh, generative AI nowadays of a, of a dog wearing glasses. Um, but I won't be really be moving towards my goal. Right. So for me, believe it or not, um, you know, here's a solution that solves this problem for me. When I'm, I've decided I'm going to spend the next one hour, and I have, I'm, my, I'm going to, I'm going to try to create an outline for this presentation. I don't really need the internet for that, so I'll actually turn off the Wi-Fi on my computer. So I'm not even tempted. Uh, I can't even go online. There's a bit of a speed bump there. Now, sometimes I'll convince myself, oh, you know what? I really need something from online. I need a picture of a dog wearing glasses. I'll just write it down on a, a notepad beside me. And in the last 10 minutes of that hour, I'll allow myself to go online and do all of these things that I think are so important uh, to use the internet, but I kind of secretly know I'm, I'm just kind of tricking myself. Um, another challenge that I had uh, during the pandemic uh, was, uh, you know, I'm online teaching at home. My daughter was doing online uh, classes. And, you know, sometimes, you know, just respecting each other's space, I'm trying to teach. So, you know, I tried putting up signs. Here's all the things that you might possibly need. Didn't seem to work. So I had to think of another solution to this problem. So one day I decided to fight fire with fire. And so while she was in her online class, um, you know, I would interrupt her. I'd come in and say, oh, is that, is it your class right now? Oh, I, I, didn't realize. I, I was just wondering, have you seen my hoodie? You know, that, that really comfortable hoodie that I, I like? And then I'd come back a minute later. Oh, your class is still going on? Oh, I was just wondering if you could peel these oranges for me. Like, you know, I hate getting like that stuff all over my hands. Um, the, the craziest one I was going to try out was uh, to interrupt the class and say, hey, have you seen the lice brush? Because it's not where it's supposed to be. Um. And the teacher knew exactly what I was doing. Um, after this, uh, we kind of came to agreement to look, not interrupt each other. A bit of an extreme uh, solution to this problem, maybe. But I want you to take a moment to think about the challenges to your workflow that might be impeding your productivity. Maybe you've never really thought through these problems before, but identify one of these uh, challenges and then think of a solution, test it out, and then refine that solution until it becomes an improved solution. And then just like me with my dishwasher, it'll give you just that little bit of pleasure and it'll save you that little bit of time so that you can actually focus on other things. Okay, the last thing that we'll go into a bit more details is restoration. 
So earlier I told you that, you know, the best thing that cognitive psychologists have demonstrated experimentally is going for a 30 minute walk in nature, but we don't always time have time to do that. But maybe you can think about how exercise can be integrated into your work schedule. So I said, you know, even going up flights of stairs several times a day can have a significant impact. Um, but there, maybe there's other creative ways that you can do that. And I'll give you an example from my life as well. So um, in March, um, there is a two week period where I am conducting multiple interviews. Each interview is half an hour uh, and it's all day long. So eight hours a day, um, every half hour, I'm meeting someone new. Um, it could be exhausting, uh, mentally draining, um, and I'm sitting behind a desk the entire time. And so one thing I realized is that the first half of each interview, I'm essentially just trying to get to know the person to see if they would be a good teacher. And so I realized we don't have to be sitting at a desk. So I turned that first half into a walking meeting. So we would walk around campus. I would ask questions, get to know them, and then we would come back to my office and then do a, a teaching demo. I found that the quality of, of my performance as an interviewer, I think, was better. I, I felt more energized. And on these days, um, I would actually get you know an, an additional five to eight kilometers of walking that I normally would not. And you know, normally I'd just be behind my desk and feeling just like really drained. And so this kind of thoughtful adjustment uh, to my schedule really made a big difference. Okay. Sometimes you don't have time for a 30 minute walk. Maybe you only have a minute or a few minutes at most. Well, think about the type of break that you actually take. Um, and what we think um, creates a good break is one that's restorative in nature. One that maybe breaks and shifts the context so that you're, you could replenish your attention, motivation, and energy. So if you're working on a project and then your break is to check email, it's not really a break. That's just switching from one cognitive task to another cognitive task. So maybe doing some stretching, maybe changing the context by uh, engaging in this uh, gratitude uh, exercise, um, engaging in some breathing and progressive relaxation, reflecting on nature, listening to a meditation track, or having a uh, nutritious snack. Sometimes, you know, I have back-to-back -back meetings online and I only have a minute. And when I only have a minute, uh, I'll engage in breathing exercises. I'll just for one minute, I'll do a progressive relaxation where I you know, inhale for a count of four, hold for a count of four, exhale for a count of four, hold for a count of four and repeat, even just kind of slowing down my heart rate and getting myself to relax, closing my eyes. If I only have a minute, that's what I'll do. And it at least stops me from this downward spiral. Okay, a couple other points about restoration that I, I, I want to emphasize. Um, I had a chance to interview this man, Matt Walker, for another alumni event. And it was uh, a, a very uh, engaging conversation where I learned a lot about sleep. And uh, when you ask people, you know, for health and well-being, you know, what are the things that you should do? And people kind of know that, uh, you know, you should exercise, you should probably eat well, and you should probably get sleep. If you ask people to prioritize these, typically the last on this priority list is sleep. But Matt Walker suggests that sleep should be your top priority. In fact, he even goes as far as to say that sleep is the foundation on which the pillars of exercise and diet rest. And so, um, you know, if you can you miss, can a healthy person miss one meal? Can they miss a workout? Can they miss, uh, have one bad night of sleep? The answer is yes. I'm sure you can recover. But if you're chronically missing out on your meals, if you're chronically missing out on exercise, I think you can see how that could be detrimental. But many of us are chronically depriving ourselves of sleep. And this has a huge impact on your overall health, um, your, uh, your mental state, and um, your physical uh, well-being. And so 
Matt Walker strongly emphasizes that as a society, we really do need to emphasize uh, better sleep. And sleep is not something that you could um, uh, be deprived of during the week and then try to catch up on the weekend. It doesn't work that way. We need to act, uh, prioritize sleep every day. So I told you earlier that one of the problems that I found myself uh, engaged in during the pandemic was that I would I'd be lying in bed, reading my phone about all these things that there's nothing that I can do. So I would be winding my brain up instead of winding down. So a better practice would be to plan some sort of evening buffer zone activity. So I would say at least two hours before bed, uh, not being on your phone and doing something different. So for me, you know, part of that would be maybe I'll do some yoga. Uh, I, I take a hot bath every night. I find it so relaxing. Uh, and that really gets me into the mindset for a restful uh, wind down that leads to a better sleep. I had another opportunity with another McMaster alumni event where I interviewed um, Mark Schultz, who is part of the world's longest study, a uh, scientific study of happiness. And the main emphasis from uh, this uh, decades long research is that we really need to prioritize and invest in relationships. Um, so just to kind of give you an example, if let's say you're 40, and you have a friend that you speak with, you meet one uh, every week, and you have coffee for one hour a week. Uh, and you do this consistently. Well, by the time you're 80, the total time that you, you all spent together is 87 total days. Okay. Now, I want you to take a moment and think about how much time that you spend on your phone. It's shocking how much time people spend on their phone. Um, you know, sometimes their phone is just always with them. Uh, and, you know, some people spend 11 hours a day on their phone. So if you're 40 and we look at the same comparison period to 80, um, that's to a total of 18 years of waking time, uh, of total time that you're spending on your phone. And so think about the priorities of spending time on your phone versus actually investing in relationships. So as a take-home exercise, uh, schedule restorative breaks hourly. So even if it's just a one minute break uh, and regular exercise into your workday and make sure that you keep your social networks nourished. So that brings us to the conclusion of goals versus systems and using psychology to improve productivity. We talked a bit about the difference between uh, short-term goals uh, and implementing a systems as a long-term upgrade. And uh, uh, one way that I suggested motivating this is to look at three different steps of focusing, problem solving, restoring, collecting feedback on this, and then repeating this process. One last bit of advice for those of you who uh, work with computers, all day long, um, you know, many of these jobs, uh, the work is never done. So you never feel some closure. Um, for, for this, I, I really recommend having some sort of shutdown routine that closes out your day to reduce stress and set up the next morning. So here's what I do. I will go through my daily journal at the end of the day, see what I've ticked off, see what is left to do, see, I'll give myself an assessment, you know, did I assign myself the right amount of work? I'll review my calendar for my upcoming appointments the next day and the rest of the week. And then I have a closing ceremony. So I take a pen and I, I bang it and then I close down my computer. And this gives me a behavioral marker that the day is done, go home, restore and get ready for the next day. That is it. And uh, if you found this talk to be helpful, uh, I have a longer version of this available. Uh, it's geared towards students, but covers many of the same principles at macintrospsych.com. It's called The Psychology of Surviving and Thriving in a Pandemic Semester. And there's a, a couple of other talks uh, on that website that you might find useful, or if there's a student that you know, uh, they might find it uh, useful as well. Thank you so much, and I will turn 
it back uh, over to Christine for some Q&A. Thank you, Joe. And for those of you who have joined us um, from previous At Home with Mac talks, uh, yes, usually Joe's on this side. Joe is, uh, I always call on Joe to say, hey, do you want to interview? So we had Lori, you interviewed Lori Santos, uh, who's a very famous psychologist from uh, Yale. Uh, you interviewed Matt Walker, who is from University of California, sure. Berkeley, right? Yep. Berkeley. Uh, Mark and Mark Schultz. Yes. So you were on the other end. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for letting me interview you and you know you um, impart all of your knowledge uh to our uh, to our guests so there are a couple of questions actually there's lots of questions in the q a but one question i had that i never asked you before but you you brought it up so when you were talking about you know with the goals the cue the streamlining and the reward and you were talking about extrinsic rewards so you listen to the podcast or you'll have your cup of coffee at some point, if you keep rewarding yourself with extrinsic, do then do you not even need that extrinsic reward, but then it becomes yeah. intrinsic? Yeah, um, you're right. So um, I use that as when I'm trying to establish a brand new habit that I want to integrate into my system. So the other thing I, I, I want to point out is that there's a danger in being overly ambitious when you're setting up your system, like start small, start modest, establish that one habit, use the cue streamline and reinforcement to really get it going. Um, and then after a while, I think it has its own intrinsic reward. And uh, for those earliest parts of like the system that I'm setting up, like I don't really need any reward. It's just ingrained in me. Uh, and in fact, if I don't do it, you know, I feel like something, uh, is a bit off, right? So if I have a, um, very early morning flight or something and, and, I, and I can't, you know, do like some elements of my morning routine, like, like doing my 30 minute workout in the morning, like I feel kind of antsy, right? Um, so start small, uh, build in with like this bigger vision of the system that you're trying to establish uh, and then move move on from there. Great. Okay. So that's good. So it, it does become that it becomes just part of your routine, part of yeah. your habit and you don't need. Yeah. It's not like these four parts of my morning routine that I need to reward myself after <laughs> each one uh, <laughs> yeah. after all this time. Yeah. So Kristen's asking, you talked about the mission statement and um, some people were commenting in the chat like that was really people hadn't thought of that they, they really like that addition so she's asking do you have different mission statements for different parts of your life so one for your family one for your lab one for your upcoming book etc cetera, etc cetera. <laughs> um so i i have i would say um for any organization that i'm leading uh i want to have a mission statement so that we as a group know what's happening and uh, understand where we want to invest our limited resources, right? And so I find that to be very helpful for a group. Within that group, so for example, uh, within my lab, we have a mission statement, but ideally every individual um, uh, member, like a grad student, should have their own mission statement. And uh, we want to see where their mission statement aligns with the lab and that's where things will prioritize because every grad student within my lab is going to have a bit of a different mission statement and journey that they want to go on. And so we're going, to, then we could try to find ways to align the group mission statement with that individual mission statement. As I said, I also shared my own kind of professional mission statement that guides, um, you know, some of the choices that I have. So there's there's some things that I work, I have no choice. I'm assigned things to do all the time. But there are also elements of my job where um, I do have choice. And so, Christine, whenever you ask me to do something, uh, it always seems to line up <laughs> with my mission statement. So how can I say no? Um, and then I think, you know, another level that, you know, there could be a mission statement could be a family. So a family can together have a mission statement because a family is like any other 
group. There's a limited budget. There's limited time. There's limited resources. And so uh, putting all of these big pieces into place um, is something that the group can prioritize together. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's, a, that's actually a really good idea to come together as a family. So then you can decide like on Sundays, we're not going to use our phones and we're going to spend yeah. our time together. But yeah. if parents are just dictating that to their children, they mm -hmm. might get some pushback. Agreed. Great. So we have a physician who has asking the question. So she has very busy clinics mm -hmm. and she needs advice on how to train and how to train support staff to not interrupt flow for their own purposes. Please advise. I'm thinking of Monica's <laughs> story. With yeah. The classroom, right. <laughs> so um, I, I, I really do sympathize with uh, super busy physicians uh i've had a chance to uh you know work with our own like department of faculty of medicine uh you know especially like uh physician um uh scientists that you know they're they're clin they're running clinic they're running a lab they are really really stretched and i also sympathize you know with someone working in an open office uh in a cubicle setting where there's so many different people um noises going on people coming up and say hey where's a stapler and you like you're trying to uh get into this flow state so one of the things i'm actually interested in as a researcher too is this this elusive thing called flow state so if i could give you an example of someone who's writing you know it you're trying to get all this information loaded into your working memory uh, and then you start writing and then you, you, you sometimes reach this point where the words seem to be just flowing out of you. Uh, I'm hoping to experience this uh, in, in writing a book at some point. Um, and the worst thing that could happen is, you know, uh, someone just comes up to you and says, uh, excuse me, uh, do you know where the stapler is? And then you're like, what, what? And then you answer that question and then you come back and you're like, oh, where was I? And like, you've lost it, right? Sometimes, so a couple of solutions. First, um, it's kind of like a like a work culture thing where like we're in this setting, we could interrupt each other, but maybe you could give off some sort of social cues that, hey, I, I'm kind of in this deep work state. Please do not interrupt me unless absolutely necessary. Like maybe it's even something like putting on headphones to cue people, right? Sometimes people don't realize that. In that case, when someone interrupts you, just say, just a moment, please. And then take a take 30 seconds to write down stream of consciousness, what's going on in your mind right now. What are you thinking about? What's the next step? Write all that down. It won't necessarily mean anything to an, any other person reading it. Address the interruption. Say that the stapler's where it's always supposed to be. Come back read through your own stream of consciousness text, and then it'll give you a fighting chance to get back into that flow state. It's better if you were never interrupted, but it might be a way for you to kind of get back uh, into that state uh, sooner rather than later. Great, thank you. So hopefully that helps. Sorry, I'm just responding um, in the chat. See, I'm... The problem when you're hosting, as you know, Joe, is there's a lot of multitasking going on, right? So there's people yeah. people in the chat can't see, but there's lots of chatter in the yeah. chat, and I'm trying to answer that, and I'm trying to listen to you, and I'm I'm trying to go through the questions as well. Which just, which does remind me, I, I do want to make a point. So I don't want people to think you should never multitask because there's some things you have no choice. Uh, but so right now, Christine, you have no choice but to be in a multitasking procedure a situation, but. Um, there are certain choices sometimes that you can make, uh, whether or not to enter into a distracting multitasking scenario. And like the example I gave is your computer. You sometimes have a choice between having multiple apps open or not. And so that is a thoughtful choice that you should actually make. Yes, choice. I don't have a choice, but um, I, I did learn that. So the two things I will say that... Uh, from taking your course and hearing you speak, the cognitive offloading, you know, making lists, that huge, that totally changed my life. And yes, not having a million things open at once so that you're only concentrating. 
So I'm living proof, everyone, that what Dr. Joe Kim says is true and works. So um, talk about concentrating and, you know, focusing. Uh, Mary Lou is asking, is there an optimal concentration time in minutes for the human brain when learning? Hmm. Or maybe for focusing? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's going to be very individual differences. Uh, for example, someone with ADHD might have a shorter attention span. Um, some people might naturally seem to be able to focus for a very long period of time. Um, what I would suggest is whatever that time period is, and maybe it's 15 minutes, maybe it's only 15 minutes that you can pay attention. But if during that 15 minutes, you dedicate yourself to this is the one task that I will be doing, uh, rather than having my attention distracted by multiple different things going on, uh, you can get a lot of work done. And you know, even using something like the Pomodoro technique, if you need that to like get that motivation uh, to get going. And then I think it also builds confidence that you have an actual system. Like, so I think part of the problem is that sometimes people don't even have, they don't have confidence that there is a system in place uh, to get this going. Um, and once you build upon these little successes, you kind of build confidence and maybe you can stretch that 15 minutes into 20 minutes. And then maybe you could stretch that 20 to 25 minutes. And then I think the question was getting at, is there an optimal period for learning? Well, some researchers suggest that an optimum period that you can try to build up to is 90 minutes. So at the onset, it seems like, wow, kind of sustained focus attention for 90 minutes. That sounds impossible. Uh, but um, with training and encouragement and support, you could build yourself up to longer work periods. It's also important to kind of be pay attention to your own ability to pay attention. If you are so stuck on trying to build as long a focus period as possible, and um, you just keep rereading the same sentence over and over again, and you're not really processing, you're probably not getting much return on your investment for time. And so maybe it'd be fine to take in a strategic break at that point. And I talked about several different ways that people could consider taking a restorative break, um, you know, not engaging in other cognitive tasks, um, you know, doing something that's reflective, you know, the different ways that I suggest a meditation track. Um, I think all of these things can be very helpful. Speaking of meditation, so someone is asking, is there a meditation app that you recommend? And then someone also mentioned, um, I guess I wasn't paying attention. Sorry, I was multitasking. Did you mention some kind of app in the beginning of the presentation? Um, okay, so I, I'm happy to share the apps that I use. Uh, you know, I have no connection <laughs> with these apps, but they're just the ones that I settled on. There's a lot of different meditation apps out there. Um, for me, and this is just my own personal preference, for lack of a better word, I don't want a meditation app that's too kind of just touchy feely. I kind of, I kind of need it. I don't know for lack of, I don't know. The one that I settled on uh, is called waking up. Um, what I kind of like about it is that it kind of goes into, it has a bit of a, a scientific foundation to it. So the creator of the app, uh, he's a neuroscientist. Uh, he has some leading researchers on it. Um, it. It's got a variety of different things on it. I personally enjoy it. Uh, I pretty much use it every day. Um, so uh, Sam Harris, if you somehow end up uh, hearing this, uh, I guess I'm giving you a, a plug <laughs> uh, for your app. Um, in terms of my uh, morning exercise, um, I like doing a 30 minute workout where I don't have to think, but gives me variety. So I use an app that's called Streaks Workout. And what I love about this is that it just tells me what to do. It gives me 40 exercises to do and I just do it and then I, I click. So it says, do 15 pushups, okay. Do 15 pushups, do 25 jumping jacks, okay. And it's got a selection of 30 different exercises that it could randomly draw from. So every day I do something a little bit different and I really enjoy it. By the way, also, 
I actually have one of those alarm clocks that you're giving away with the bright light. I love it. The reason why I like it is so for those of you who don't know, the way it works is that a half an hour before your scheduled time to wake up, the light slowly, gradually starts uh, increasing in brightness so that you actually wake up with before the alarm goes off. It has the alarm built in just in case, but I find that the light just naturally wakes me up and it, it it's more likely to coincide with the end of a sleep cycle. So those are the three products that I use. And I didn't, I didn't ask you to do a plug for the smart, for the Philips. So thank you. <laughs> so the, is the streaks workout? Is that free? Is that a free app? I think it's like five bucks. So I, I, I it's, I love it. Yeah. Um, okay. So so many. So Parm's asking this question. I know we made a distinction between system and goals. Do you think we can use a goal as part of a short-term reward for a system? Making running a, making running a habit by queuing the habit to before breakfast or streamlining it by having shoes close by and yeah. before, reinforcing it immediately by enjoying your audiobook. But also using a goal like running your first 10K is something to be proud of and tell people about. Yeah. So... I, I think the main point I want to make is to think beyond a goal, like a short-term goal, right? And in, and making that goal just being one part of the, uh, you know, one, you know, mile, mile marker along your continued journey through the system, right? And so I guess like the cleaning your room is an example, you know, uh, like, you could decide, wow, this room is just totally messy. I'm going to finally clean up my room today, or I'm going to finally clean up my fridge uh, today, right? If that's just that one short-term goal, it's inevitably going to fall apart again. But if you have a system in place, a series of habits, and you might want to reinforce each uh, small habit that goes towards that, if that helps you to establish your system, I think that could be very helpful. But my main, my, my main point is to think beyond the short-term goal and think about uh, the system that you want to uh, establish. Great. Hopefully that answers Arm's question. So big caps, what is your advice to stop doing something? Um, like, like a bad habit? I'm assuming, yes. I'm assuming yeah. the way that they've, because it's in all caps, which caught my attention. So there we go, talking yeah. about focus and attention. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm assuming, yes, it sounds like to stop doing something you mm. don't want to be doing. So I guess we could think about the same, um, uh, behavioral modification where I said, think about the cue, think of how it's streamlined and think of the, the reinforcer. So whatever the bad habit is, think about what is cueing that habit, what is streamlining it and making it easy for you to engage in that habit. And what is the reinforcement for that habit? And so breaking through this process, so getting rid of that reinforcer, getting rid of the streamlining that makes that habit so easy to do, and getting rid of the cues that remind you that you want to engage in that bad habit. So I think, can you, um, someone is asking the workout app. Is this the one, Joe? Streaks workout? Uh, yeah, it's out. called Streaks workout. Yeah, okay. I think that's the one then. Yeah. So there you go, everyone. Uh, it's this is a little bit off topic, but not really. So Evelyn wanted to know. We talked about the um, conference, your EdCog Education and Cognition. Is that up and running? Sorry, sorry for twenty twenty four. It's been up and running for like ten years. Yeah, this is going to be our twelfth year of 12th running year. the conference. Um, and the date uh, we could send out the information. It's in mid July. Um, and if you head over to edcog.mcmaster.ca we have complete information uh um so it'll be july 11th and 12th this year um we do film the talks so you can go onto the website and view talks from the previous year uh we have evidence-based workshops on the first day 
Um, and so I would encourage uh, uh, you to uh, participate. We have a public lecture that we offer through the Alumni uh, Association, always very well attended. Uh, I think if you're interested in education, training, and evidence-based practices, uh, it's it's a great place uh, for people to come out. I always love it. I, the speakers are always fantastic. Like you said, uh, you partner with us for the public lecture, and I've always learned something from um, from those speakers. So, so someone's asking, what is the text edit app you mentioned? When you were talking about oh. your paragraphs and stuff, <laughs> I didn't realize I'd be making so many product placements. But um, <laughs> the app that I use, because I uh, I have a Mac computer, uh, it's called Text Expander. Um, and what I love, and on a PC, I think there's one called Phrase Express. Um, uh, so these are one-time purchases, and then anytime I type, if I ever type a sentence that I think oh, I I. I always type this sentence, I'll create a shortcut for it. And then I have a series of shortcuts. And then, so for example, I never have to type up Department of Psychology, Neuroscience and Behavior. I just type X, P and B, and then it replaces that. And it, it works across all your apps. Um, I have a shortcut for saying no to being invited to join new projects. <laughs> that I've written this perfectly polite, uh, paragraph, and then I just fill in the blanks. Uh, so I can say no to a project with just a few keystrokes. So that might be a very uh, useful application for that physician who asked that question earlier. Just have that, have that you know, sort of on the burner, just send that. Uh, so here's a question about procrastination. So I procrastinate on tasks for which I feel that I do not have enough skills or knowledge. Same for tasks that require abstract thinking. But once I start doing those tasks, I either concentrate for hours or take frequent breaks. How do I stop doing all of this and become more productive? So uh, it sounds like the you've answered your own question. So the first step, if you don't have the proper skills or, or the background knowledge, then that's something worth prioritizing. Uh, so for example, let's say you're your your job is to work on excel file spreadsheets and part of what's stopping you from working on a file is that oh, i don't really know how to use pivot tables or some other uh process that would be useful well that you should prioritize in getting some training to learn those skills and so part of what's holding you back from starting that project is lacking those skills then um engage in a workshop or learn those prioritize learning those skills so that you could get onto it um and then sometimes you just procrastinate because like oh, i just don't want to do it and like that you know happens to me all the time uh tell you, like when it comes to admin work uh that's my least favorite thing to do uh and so that's when i use the uh, pomodoro technique where I, I convinced myself well i'll just do this for 25 minutes and then uh, right afterwards, I, I get to have a double espresso. Uh, and, you know, maybe if it's really like uh, uh, a report I don't want to do, like maybe, you know, some I, I chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> and like, And then I'll do it for 25 minutes. And I always follow through with a reward. Because if I don't, then in the future, I'll think like, what's the point? Like sometimes I don't even get the reward. So I, I really do reinforce myself uh, for doing that. Um, so I'd say those are two steps towards uh, getting to do that. And then I think the person also mentioned sometimes working too long on it. Um, if you ever catch yourself losing focus while you're working on something, that is actually a good time for you to take a break, even if it's just a one minute break where you do a progressive relaxation breathing exercise, you'll be better off and stopping that downward trajectory uh, of losing focus. But that's different than flow, right? Like, Because if you're in flow, you don't even feel like you, you're working for too exactly. long. Exactly. It's, it's like, I oh, laborious. I, exactly. I wouldn't uh, necessarily purposely stop a flow state where I really am in the zone and, and feeling productive and, uh, and, and feeling like reward from doing that. Great. Okay. One where it's eight 30 and um, I'm, I am mindful of time. One question, one last question. Sure. Can you have more than one personal goal? 
Um, or do you think you should change? Because you talked about how you you evaluate after each semester for because that's yeah. sort of how your calendar works. So is that a better way of approaching it rather than having like all these different goals and then not being able to accomplish any of them? Yeah, I think I think it, a, a skill to develop is to be realistic in your goals. So I, I, I'll give you an example. So um, I, I work at three levels. So every semester, I, I mentioned that I'll revisit my own kind of personal mission statement. And this is an opportunity for me to prioritize projects and goals for the next four months, right? And see how they line up with my mission statement. There's only so much that I could do in the four months, right? So if this was the end, if this was four months from today and I got these items done, that's a win, right? Some of them might be for someday maybe, but right now this is what I'm going to focus on. Every week on Sundays, I set aside 90 minutes to do some work. The first 30 minutes are for reviewing my past week and looking at my upcoming week and planning my priorities. So the way I set my priorities is if this was the end of the week and I got the following items done, that's a win. And I might draw upon my uh, semester long um, uh, priorities uh, and, and put them into the week. On a daily basis, uh, as I mentioned, every morning, and some people might do this the night before, I'll spend 10 minutes journaling and prioritizing what I want to get done that day, right? Um, the, the biggest mistake is people at this level of the daily goals and priorities, uh, they give themselves way too much. So if I could give you an example from a student perspective, they might say, finally catch up on all of biology today. That is not an achievable goal or reasonable step for one single day. But reading chapter four, that is definitely reasonable. And so one of the things that you know you'll learn is to, to come up with a reasonable balance. So at the end of the day, when I do my shutdown routine, I'm reviewing my daily journal. I'm like, sometimes I think, wow, way too ambitious. Uh, I could not have possibly got that done. There's rarely a case where I don't assign myself enough uh, to do. And then sometimes life just happens. And like I had the best of intentions, but this happened, that happened. My child was sick, forgot a lunch. I had to do this. An appointment came up. So I, I can achieve, but that's okay. But when you have this system, it is okay. Because <laughs> then you think, yeah, I, I got off of it, but. It's like if you if you have an overall system of eating well, you know, every, once in a while, yeah, you can cheat, you can do this, and like the system will like bring you back into place. But if you don't even have a system, every single time that you engage in treats or something, you're gonna probably feel guilty and bad and like, oh, I don't, this is not going anywhere near. But that's why putting these big pieces into place gives you confidence and motivation. Excellent. Well, I think that is the a great way to end. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone who joined. Lots of um, people are asking lots of questions. During, so you, as I mentioned before, you'll get a recording of this and I'll go through the chat and figure out like some people are asking, um, you know, the apps that Joe talked about. We'll put all of that in, in the resources section in the email that you'll get with the link to the recording. So fear not. Um, Quick keys, Apple text app quickies. Uh, I'll put that down too, so that you can revisit the uh, the talk and all of the resources because we certainly want um, want you to be able to take all of the information that you learned from tonight and apply it so that you can um, have the most productive have the most productive twenty twenty four. So oh. thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Joe. No, sorry. I, I was just saying, Christine. I, I, I'll coordinate with you. And we could make sure we have all the right links and then you could send a follow-up email. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Joe. So in a couple of weeks, as I mentioned before, Joe and I um, are doing another um, event. So one of, the, one of many Joe's hats is uh, he is the faculty director of the McCall, McBain, McCall McBain 
teaching. I don't know. It's a long the, I just teaching and them, leadership program. Yes. The McCall McBain uh, postdoc fellows. So if you are in Hamilton and you want to come to campus uh, and see these fantastic speakers, there's six postdoc um, yep. fellows and they're going to do a little 10 minute talk on their research. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. We've been doing it online for there. Thank you, Dave. There it is right there. We've been doing it online. We started it in, I think, 2021 uh, online, and we're going to do a hybrid. So if you're in Hamilton and you want to come to campus, we'll be having um, some real appetizers between 630 and seven, and at seven, we'll go live. And for people who aren't in Hamilton, but if you want to join us, you can uh, just uh, watch like as, as a webinar. And I can't think of a more romantic way to spend Valentine's Day. Exactly. <laughs> Learning. You can learn together as a couple. That Maybe exactly. that's a, that's one of your goals, to learn exactly. with your partner or with a friend or something. Uh, yeah, so that is Valentine's Day. So we hope that you will be able to join us at that event or any other of our upcoming events. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Joe, for a fantastic talk, as always. You are, your, you are so knowledgeable. And this is why I took first year psych. And to be honest, Joe inspired. I actually went back and did a whole psychology degree. Took me, took me seven years to do it. Yeah. But, but I did it. part time. <laughs> yeah. um, I learned a lot about time management from Joe Kim. So thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. And we will see you again soon, hopefully. Bye for now.